All righty. Um, so common thing that people say is, you're in security, how do I break into it? So that's kind of what I've I distilled this into. But one thing I want to emphasize is this is just one person's perspective. Different people have different answers to the question of how you break into information security. So some people might go, that's a horrible way to do it. Some people might go, that's exactly how I did it. So different people, different perspectives. Just find the one that's right for you. But no matter what you do, don't do it the way that I did. I spent 15 years beforehand, and then I finally got there. You also probably don't want to hunt down an old VAX machine and Novell system to do your first system administration education on. So you just don't want to do it the way I did. Um, who am I? Uh, masters in chemistry. Yeah, real relevant. Actually, there is some relevance. Um, been in the IT industry, currently working for a startup. The longest time I've been in any one job for security was at an e-commerce company for about seven years. And I've done a lot of interviewing. Um, one thing that I'm going to put out there, if you find me on LinkedIn and you want to do a um, mock interview, I'm happy to do that. Just mention this conference when you connect on LinkedIn, and I'm happy to do mock interviews with, for people. My titles, help desk, QA engineer, systems engineer, IT manager, blah, 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 blah. You can go through the whole list. But what I want to point out today is I want to start off by kind of answering the question. And I'm not going to answer the question. I'm going to kind of get you go to answer the question. What is security for you? And find some ways to get there. And one of the reasons why I'm saying that security makes up I have in my, on here dozens, I haven't gone out and count, you could argue it's hundreds of different roles. It's kind of like you're in security is saying you're a lawyer. Some people specialize in business law, some people specialize in copyright law, there's all sorts of different types of lawyers. Security, it's the same type of thing. They have a general core that's in security, but the actual thing and focus is gonna vary widely from role to role for different individuals. That said, I have found some very common traits amongst different security people. Um, you have to be a constant learner. The industry changes too fast. I've been in presentations for most of today on AI. Wasn't even on our radar five years ago, let alone 10 years ago. If you're not, some people say it has to be a passion. I disagree with that statement because my passion is swimming. If, you could, if I could do anything for a living, I would do swimming, but I'm not that good, so I do security. I'm interested in security. I enjoy doing security. I'm interested in learning about it, so I can keep going. I can keep learning. If you're not willing to keep learning, you are going to not succeed in the field. You also have to be comfortable with ambiguity. Um, it used to be security people were the people who just said no and that was how they survived their job, that doesn't work anymore in this field. You have to be able to go, well, based on my understanding of this, we're gonna go down this path, but you can't know absolutely. You have, one of the things I like to stay, say about my job is to distill ambiguity into action. So you take that ambiguity and you make it something that you're actually gonna work against. And you have to be willing to make mistakes. Every security person is going to make a mistake. And if you're not willing to, do, to take a chance and make a mistake, you're going to really struggle. So given those three kind of general traits that are useful to have, there are other things that are kind of individual specific that can kind of help guide you into what your kind of role is. Are you someone who likes to build things? Are you someone who likes to make things and see the results of what you've built? Or are you someone who likes to break things. You like to take them apart and see the different pieces and watch things crash to the ground. Or are you someone who likes to go and see all these different pieces and analyze them and put together in a nice little puzzle and get that puzzle and pieces and everything looks very pretty? I can't answer that question for you. That's a question you have to answer. But if you think about that, think about what that is for you because it's really important for helping you pick the field that's going to be something that you stay interested in. You want to find the role that speaks to you, and now I'm starting to throw things at you, and the one, number one thing that I want you to not do here is panic. You, you make some decisions, you make some things. I want to remind you, I started out with a master's in chemistry. 
and I'm now a senior security engineer. Um, the path, it's a journey. You take different steps along that path. And sometimes you come to forks in the road, and you stay on that path. Sometimes you take a fork in the road, and then you rapidly move back to the previous path that you were on. It varies from person to person. Now, a lot of people start with the idea that security is a pen tester. They're the people who come in and break things. We talked about that capture the flag tournament over the lunch hour and things like that. And that is a facet of security. But if this was the secu only security role available, I would not be up here today because I am miserable at it. Um, I'm a really bad pen tester when it comes to using the tools and the pieces and parts and everything like that. Fortunately for me, there's lots of other roles. Um, there's an application security engineer role, which is mine, network security engineer, cloud security engineer, security analyst. There's all sorts of different roles out there. I'm not going to go through all of them here for you. I'm going to kind of leave that to you. But one of the dangers if you're saying, well, I want to be a security engineer, and this is an eye test. I understand that this is mainly there for the people who are breaking out the, who actually bring up the slides. But the key thing is the title of security engineer, security analyst, se compliance. All of these things are going to mean different things to different companies. Sometimes a security engineer is a red teamer. Sometimes a security engineer is a blue teamer. If you don't know what I, those terms mean, it's something you're going to want to work on building up that vocabulary with, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but it takes some time to figure out what that, mean, what that means for you. For me, application security engineer, that means I develop secure coding practices, I conduct application security assessments, and I perform security reviews those are my core things. Now, if you're just starting off in information security and you don't have any experience with software development or anything like that, this is going to be a little overwhelming. And you're going to be sitting there going, I don't know how to do any of this stuff, or I might not kind of know what each of these things are. And one of the things you're going to want to think is, how are you going to build up your skill sets? Because each of these things are broken into different pieces. Like, if I want to develop and implement secure coding practices, I need to know how to code. I need to understand what, so what makes up software vulnerabilities. I need to understand different coding standards, and that's unlikely something you're going to get initially in academia. It's more likely something you're going to encounter in industry. And if I was going to say the various different, for lack of a better term, holy wars that occur within software development and having different coding standards is one of those in which you can have any three engineers and they come up with four different coding standards they want to adhere to. And that's only a mild exaggeration. Um, and you need to know to, how to work within that range of skills and do that negotiation and work with the team. Because if, you, as a, if I come in and as a security engineer and say, you need to code everything this way, and none of the software developers agree with me, none of them um, go, they're just going to look at me and go, no, and let's keep doing the thing. So you have to figure out how to navigate the politics, navigate the pieces and parts, and how to work with the different people in order to get there. So it's not just technical skills. So application security engineer, how do you get there? So this is somebody that I mentored. And this was their path to get there. They started off as a software developer. Then they became a cybersecurity intern. And then they became a support engineer. And then they started down the path of application security engineer, security engineer, and senior security engineer. And I actually didn't start mentoring them until that line over from support engineer to application security engineer. That was where I helped them. Amazon has a great mentor program that I was very happy to be a part of. Um, I was not part of her promotion to senior security engineer, but I helped at other points in time. And you'd be surprised how many people start at that support engineer role, help desk, things like that. I hear a lot of different people starting in those roles. Now, that was someone that I got off of LinkedIn. If you really want to find different paths, LinkedIn is a great tool. You can go and see. How far back did, so some, you have an interesting title, you go, you search for that title, and then you can go back and see what they started with. Now, not everybody puts their first jobs on LinkedIn. 
So sometimes it can be a little deceiving if you see someone that starts and they say senior security engineer is the first thing, well, that means they're, they're keeping things out. But lots of people do. So take advantage of that as a tool to kind of think about possible first jobs for you. And then once you figure out those first jobs, the next question becomes, what skills do you have? Do you have programming skills, but you need secured audit skills? What are the skills that you're going to need to work along this path? What are the skills that you're going to need to get to that first job? And one of the th reasons I'm talking about getting to the first job and not getting to the ideal job is, let me just put it this way. I hope your ideal job isn't an entry level job. I hope your ideal job is something that ha requires five, 10, or something like that experience. And you're not going to be able to get to that job immediately. I did a lot of interviewing, and one of the most off-turning things to do is to deal with in an interview is have somebody who clearly has none of the experience say, I'm looking for a senior level role. OK, you're not going to get one, but you can keep looking. And it kind of ends the discussion right there, because you know that they don't have realistic expectations. So you want to align where you're going. Now, I'm not saying stretch it. Now, especially if you look at the statistics, um, Women, minorities are less likely to apply to jobs that they don't have 100%. I'm not saying don't apply to jobs that you don't have 100%. It's OK to stretch. If you have 60 70%, go for it. But you better have 60 to 70% rather than 10%. And that's the main thing. But um, I don't know that I've ever applied to a job that I had 100% of the job skills in. So I've, and in fact, my current job they're, one of the things they highlighted, they said they needed a specific skill set. And I told them up front, I have everything else but this one skill set that you've highlighted, but this is some of the background that I have so that I would be able to come up to speed in a couple months in order to get there. And I got the job was able to get, I, I had been laid off, my severance ended March 31st, my new job started April 1st, and it went on nice and smooth. Um, so you don't have to have 100%. But you need to have and be able to demonstrate that you can get to the 100% in a reasonable time frame. So that means as you start investigating the paths, you're going to want to start learning. And I don't know what you want to start learning. I don't know if you want to start coding, if you want to start networking, operating systems. Maybe you want to go into compliance. Maybe you're really interested in all of the privacy laws and the security requirements for the supply, the privacy laws, so you want to be interested in legal. I don't know. but. The key is you want to learn as much as you can. And those of you that are fortunate enough to still be in school get the advantage of being able to have that rich learning environment. But I will say there is one thing that's better than being in school, and that is getting a job and getting paid to learn. <laughs> and so if you can get paid to learn, that's kind of the, that's the creme de la creme of job duties. So get that first job and start working there. It's not just classes. There's different places that you can learn and pay attention to different and learn the vocabulary. Um, I cheated a little bit at the last minute um, and threw on one link here that's not on the slide deck, and that's the dc541.org. That's the Eugene chapter of DEF CON that meets once a month. So if you're really interested in meeting with other security people in Eugene, that's the website to go to get more information on. DC541.org. Um, but one of the biggest challenges for getting into security is the vocabulary. Are you comfortable talking it? You get this, the fact that I was able to leverage a CQI vulnerability to achieve an RCA, that meant that their pen that PCI pen test was rather ugly. 
That's a sentence that's going to happen in business, and if you're not comfortable with those types of sentences, it's going to be harder to work through it. Do you have to know all of the vocabulary? No. There is more than once in which I raise my hand in the middle of a meeting and go, oh, sorry, not up to date on all acronyms. What are they? But if you can, what, what did you mean there? But if you can learn some of the pieces and the parts, that's going to help you along the way. So there's all these different vocabulary and places that you can go to learn the vocabulary. My recommendation is you try things to see what you like to do. One of the resources that's really great for if you don't have access to other Capture the Flags, and like I said, I'm not a good pen tester, so I know other people will have better resources, but I really like the Hack the Box environment. It was a great place for me to go and play around and learn, yeah, this really isn't my strength. Um, if you like to build, write code, build security tools, see what you like to do. If you want to analyze, and you might kind of cringe at this, but I really found that my chemistry courses were the best analysis training that I got. Um, so if you really like your science courses and you're still like, yeah, I really like science, but I'd rather go into security, that's okay. You can take certain aspects, aspects of that skill set into information security. One of the things that I do all the time is I have, whenever I'm in analyzing an incident response or something, it's the question, my, I have my graduate professors hammer me in the back of the head, what's your evidence, what's your evidence, what's your evidence? And so as you're sitting there, sitting, so the point that I want to bring up here is it doesn't matter what you learn as long as you keep learning. It's going to be applicable in security. I haven't found anything that doesn't have some aspect that's relevant in security. Now, you've started talking. You've done some investigations. You've found some jobs that might be interesting to you. What's the next question? Well, next step. What I'd recommend is talking to people. Now. I have, I'm pretty active with my college's alumni group. I went to Grinnell College. Um, and it's a lot easier for me to answer the question of, I see this, or can you give me some details about it, or something like this. If someone goes, what do you do? It's kind of like, I could spend a week talking about that and I'd only cover part of it. So having specific questions is really valuable. And since we are at UO, Take advantage of your alumni network. There's one graduating class that's produced every year out of here, and you've probably got 30 years of graduating classes out there of people at various different points in their careers. And if they've become, if they've chosen to become part of that alumni network, that means they want to talk to you. Um, if you're not part of UO, from somewhere else, take advantage of other alumni networks. Um, take advantage of any network you can find. Um, but some advices that I have about networking, um, approach it from a learning perspective rather than trying to get something out of people. I've dealt with people who show up to that and say, I want a job, and I go, that's interesting. And then the conversation kind of ends because it's kind of like, I don't know how to help you beyond that because I can't help you with your wants. Um, so it's one thing to talk about teaching and it's another thing to talk about um, teach me about something versus do you have any resources? Do you have places that you went to learn about this? Where did you go? So these are, these are ways that you can strategically ask questions in order to get to there. Other things you can ask them, what was your first full-time job? which job helped you prepare for getting where you are. Um, and once again, I'm bringing up LinkedIn. Um, but just ask them questions about their path. Ask them questions about the skill sets and where they picked up their skill sets. Learn from what, learn from their mistakes and learn from what they've done. I'm also going to throw out a kind of less common opinion I have about networking, and that is Always do good work and always demonstrate you are someone who would be good to work with. Now, the reason that I throw that out there is you'd be surprised the number of people who try to leverage their network to say, hey, can you introduce me here? And I can go, yeah, I can introduce you, but I don't know anything about your skill set. I don't know anything about your ability. So if I'm, not going, I'm not going to go out on a limb and say anything that's going to put my reputation on the line 
in order to recommend you for a job. But if I have some data points, I will share those data points. Um, another thing, I mean, I'll give another story that I went through. Um, back when I was an IT manager and I was hiring, I was at an alumni swim meet. And I saw a woman who was running the equipment and she just had her act entirely together. She was running the meet so smoothly, everything. And I just struck up a conversation. Oh, she was a comp science major, okay. And she was from the town that I worked in, okay. And she was looking for a job. Well, I have an internship this summer and I could see that she did good work and that she had a comp sci major and it was an internship, so it was a low risk thing. So I was like, okay, we'll apply and if there's an opening, we'll bring on. I brought her on. She's a VP somewhere now. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's that demonstration, dem always demonstrate that you can do good work, always demonstrate that you're someone who's good to work with. And it, de I mean, if you're mowing someone's lawn and you're doing good work and you're demonstrating that you're paying attention to that detail, who knows who that person is and what they've done? And you never know what they're going to do. So if you always have that demonstrated good person, good quality work, you have a reference point. So moving on from networking, one of the questions I often get is, what about certifications? So I have certifications. They were helpful for me to get that first job. Um, they demonstrate a certain level of knowledge, but they don't give you a lot of business context. Um, there are so many different certifications out there and they can be very expensive to get, so I recommend you really be strategic if you do approach that. Consulting firms often put higher value on those than other companies. Some companies are happy for you not to have them because it might mean that you're a little less expensive to hire. Um, but one other thing about certifications that I've found if you're gonna claim a certification, you better have the knowledge. Because I have been in many an interview in which someone claims a certification and I ask a basic question from within that certification and they don't have an answer. And if you don't understand the, if you come in with a certification and you don't demonstrate the knowledge, I'm going to be very, very wary of you and your skill set. So you wanna demonstrate that you have that skill set, that starting point to back up the claim of the certification. So now that you've gone through all that, you find a starting point, whatever it is, wherever you can go, sometimes it's a software development, software analyst, analyst all sorts of things, but just find that job so that you can do the best, you have the single best job duty, which is getting paid to learn, and every job should have some facet of it in which there's, whether it's an hour a week, two hours a week in which, and it's not, it may not even be formal learning. Formal learning. It might just be something where you, I ran across something unknown, so you have to do some Google searches or AI queries or whatever the magic thing is to get the knowledge into your brain and take that from there. And you take advantage of that, so you learn a little bit on the job. It's not formal, but you learn. Figure out what security means for you, identify the skills, find the path, get that first job, and go from there. And questions? I've seen help desk, I've seen software developers. One of the advantages about a software developer path is a lot of large corporations have college hire programs. So because they have that entry level job of a college hire, they, one of the single most frustrating things to me about large organizations and the cybersecurity space is that there are many organizations who could develop entry level paths for, in the cybersecurity space, but they just don't. And so I'm sitting there going, you have the resources, you have the need, but you're just not gonna put in the effort, okay. So, help desk, software development, some data, an some security analyst roles are sometimes entry level in which you're just going in and evaluating what you're doing in that space. Uh, 
I would say that that is a common one, especially if you can be part of one of the university programs in which you can do something like that for a, and have work experience during the college. I mean, those programs are gold. I mean, if you can get involved and get part of that so you can get that job, educate, that job experience so you can say, I have X number of months, years, whatever it is, doing that thing, that's really valuable. Other questions? Yeah. Yep. You don't go and do your, your classes and your residency and boom, you're a doctor. It's different. I used to be high school mathematics. I now work. In <laughs> I actually have I actually have my high school math teaching certification. I got it in 2010, and then I was like, oh no, I I can't survive the classroom. They're gonna eat me alive. <laughs> Yep. One of the things that has intrigued me is how do you showcase that? I don't work. Um, so, and so, just to give oh. you an idea, one of the ways that I'm curious on if it's possible to leverage is LinkedIn. But go ahead and. Yeah. So, that's hard. Um, you're often doing it in your current role and. Ideally, you get that first job, and then people leave companies and go and move on to other companies. So you've got that demonst demonstrable good work in one company, and then the people go to that next company, and you can talk to them and find the places. Um, or because, so it's demonstrating that you do good work with the company that you have, establishing a lot of connections within that company to people who can then be that next layer out is the way that I'd recommend doing that. That's how you're gonna get the most traction in that space because I mean, a large number of my jobs have been, oh, I, someone changes a job, they're now at the new job and they're like, Chris, you do this stuff, you wanna come here? And that type of thing is the next level up that I've done. Um, it varies from situation to situation, but it's, the, the thing that you want to be very, you kind of want to avoid is asking for a recommendation as opposed to an introduction unless the people actually know your work. I, I realize it's a very wishy-washy answer, but unfortunately I can't give you more precision than that around that. Oh yeah, it's everywhere. Yep. It's amazing how many times doing good work in out of context has led to advantages and how doing bad work out of context has led to disadvantages. Other questions? My best advice for someone just out of school trying to get into security. <laughs> my best advice um, find alumni who are closer to the position than I am and see if they can help you um, I'm don't follow my path my path takes too long um, I'm far enough removed from that brand new absolute level to say what the exact right thing to put on your resume is for a help desk job right now, um, but I'm currently working with someone she started at Apple Genius, and she now leads an IT department. And she's going to be taking that next, and she's looking to take that next step potentially into cybersecurity project management. So literally she started in an Apple Genius bar. <laughs> so I, I don't know what the right first step is for you, but um, just, 
I mean, I, there, was one play, there was one person, and we're at time. Uh, anybody object if I go a little over? Okay. So, I, one of, so one of the people that I worked with who I was mentoring, who was trying to get that first help desk job, he had 11 years of military experience. And he was like, I don't know what to do with this. And I'm like, okay, describe what you did in the military. And he was responsible for packing parachutes. Okay, if there was a job that had any higher level of requiring attention to detail and being right 100% of the time, I don't know of one. So I was like, leverage that. You have that skill set that you can use to advertise your abilities. So look back into the other things you've done. What other things have you done that might have that, have you scooped ice cream? and have customer service. Do you have any other customer service type roles that you can leverage? Do you have any other? So kind of the secret isn't them, is to say, for this, that first job hunt, is to strategically place your current experience and make it relevant to the job you're applying to. All righty, I know I'm over time, so thank you everyone.